Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the December edition of the Crips AI and Data Show. It's great to have you here. My name is Matthew Holman. I'm a partner in the team here at Crips, and we have got a jam-packed agenda for you today. We're going to take you through all kinds of interesting and fascinating developments in the world of AI and data. We're going to do um, the Data Use and Access Bill, and we're going to talk all about the brand new AI Management Essentials Framework. And in the studio, we will have Emily Campbell Radcliffe, who's the Head of AI Assurance at DSIT, taking your questions about this fascinating new development. If you do have any questions about that, the Q&A is open. Please start putting uh, any questions you've got into the, the Q&A function, and we will put those questions to Emily. However, before we start, I thought I would give you a quick rundown of some important dates. Uh, we did this last time, and quite a few of you came back and said that you found that really useful. So very quickly, here are some things for your diary. The first is the Crips Cathedrals and Cocktails uh, this Wednesday at 5 o'clock here at 80 Victoria Street. If you're on the webinar today, you'll get an invitation after this um, webinar. So please do come along if you can. It'd be great to see you for some drinks and nibbles. Wednesday, the 11th of December, we'll see the SCL celebrating 50 years and its book launch at DLA Piper. SCL is obviously a, a, an amazing organization, Society for Computers and Law, for those of you who don't know, uh, and it's definitely worth checking that out if you can. Friday, the 31st of January is a date for your diary because that's when the DSIT consultation on AIM concludes. Lots more on that coming up. Wednesday, the 5th of February, is the SCL Data Protection Annual Conference. Got to be there for that one. It's an absolute date in the diary, a must for anyone who does AI and data law. And finally, Wednesday, the 12th and Thursday, the 13th of March, is the IAPP, UK Intensive Data Protection Conference. I'm told that if you sign up for that conference this week, you save £200 on the sign-up fee. So well worth checking out. Let's get into the content on the data use and access bill. And uh, we've got a couple of slides for you. Um, let's get those up on the screen. So hopefully you can see those. The data use and access bill uh, is a really important development in the world of data protection. And for those of you who can't remember, it started life as the data protection and digital information bill. Then it became the Data Protection Digital Information Bill number two. Uh, no points for imaginative naming there. And it was all part of the Conservative government's policy agenda for data reform, and the aim was to try and get it through the previous parliament, but it didn't make it through uh, for various reasons, partly because there was cross-party resistance in the House and partly because the, um, I suppose the election was called a little bit early, caught a few people out, and the, the bill simply didn't make it into the sweep-up list. That wasn't the end. Um, for all of the areas of disagreement, there were lots of areas of consensus in the House. And so the bill has been republished as the Data Use and Access Bill, also known as the Dewar Bill, not to be confused with Dewar Leaper. That bill has passed its first and second stage in the House of Lords and is about to start its committee stage. An obvious question is, what does it say? Well. Uh, here are some things that survived from the old bill. The um, amendment to the definition of scientific research has been kept. Uh, for those of you who were close to the working of that bill, uh, you will remember that the definition of scientific research is found in a recital to the GDPR, but isn't found in the main body of the GDPR. What this amendment does is bring it into the scope of the bill by adopting broadly the same definition as in the recitals. There is clarification on the purpose limitation compatibility test Sounds super geeky, but it's actually really important for those of you who work on the purpose limitation principle a lot and find yourselves being asked questions by your organizations along the lines of, you know, we've got X, Y data, can we do the following with it, even though we've never tried to do it before? That's a, a real world example of trying to manage the compatibility test. And what the uh, DUA bill does is expand the um, sections on which you can use it. It, it clarifies the, the, the purpose uh, limitation and clarifies the times that you can change purpose without having to complete a compatibility test. The controversial content around recognized legitimate interest remains, and you'd find that in Annex 1 to the bill. Uh, these are things that the government deems as being appropriate uses of the legitimate interest test, and essentially you almost do away with the balancing test. And finally, the uh, automated decision-making content remains as well. So all of that content uh, was in the old bill, is in the new bill. 
But what was cold? Well, quite a lot. In fact, many of the more controversial and disagreed areas regarding data protection didn't make it into the Dewar Bill. So you remember that in the old bill, data protection officers were uh, essentially changed, culled, and rebirthed as something much lesser. All of that was taken away. If you are a data protection officer, once this bill is published, you will still be a data protection officer. The uh, change to data protection impact assessments was also taken out. Uh, this was uh, a little bit controversial, and it, uh, there was um, some clarification, possibly even watering down of the areas in which you had to report things through prior consultation to the ICO. All of that gone. Changes to the ROPA have gone. So if you were hoping for a streamlined, simpler ROPA, uh, that's records of processing, then all of that has gone too. The ability for political parties to use personal data with greater freedom, all of that was gone. And that you know, really was one of the areas of, of great disagreement in the House. Changes to subject access requests, also gone. Uh, changes to the definition of personal data also gone and changes to consent management technology is gone. On the subject access request point, uh, the change of language around manif manifestly unfounded or excessive, uh, which if you remember was going to become manifestly unfounded or vexatious, um, essentially lifting the language from the Freedom of Information Act, all of that stuff has gone too. So many of the things that probably raised a few eyebrows, I think, and, and also many of the things that were being um, allegedly thrown out there as, as potentially creating a divergent regime from the EU GDPR, a lot of that stuff has gone. Here are some things that are new. Uh, the Secretary of State can add to the definition of special category data if necessary, uh, and the, there is a, a statutory duty on the ICO to consider children's rights, which very much aligns with the ICO's own strategic priorities for the year. Uh, there is one thing you absolutely need to know about. So if you have been listening to me but typing your emails, stop what you're doing, pay attention to this. It's really important. PECA fines will become the same as GDPR fines on account of the DUA bill. I'll say it again, PECA fines will become the same as GDPR fines as a result of the DUA bill. The reason that's important, and I'm guessing most of you will know exactly why without me having to say it, is that we spend a lot of time advising on the difference between the penalties in both regimes. So for example, if you're advising on um, digital marketing or emails, and you know, for example, a, a line of advice around, is this um, compliant with the soft opt-in or not? You might find the business asking you, well, can we be fined? And it's a bit, the answer is yes, you can, but the amounts are potentially different depending on which regime is enforced. The GDPR has very high fines. PECA has very low fines. All of that will be changed on account of the Dewar Bill, which will bring harmony to those enforcement regimes. And it will, of course, mean potentially higher fines for breaches of PECA. Underline that three times, put a post-it note on your laptop. It's definitely worth knowing that that's coming down the line. That is all we have on the Data Use and Access Bill. I did say in the last show that we were going to spend a lot more time digesting and picking it apart. And perhaps we'll do that. Uh, at another time. Um, we're not doing it now because shortly after that show was aired live, the government published uh, the Artificial Intelligence Management Essentials. And this feels like a good time to come back into the studio and for uh, us to talk about the Artificial Intelligence Management Essentials. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce to you our special guest, Emily campbell Ratcliffe. Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. It is customary that every special guest, however very special they are, must be asked some icebreaker questions. Is it okay if I ask you some questions? Absolutely. Excellent news. All of these questions are Christmas themed. Uh, they are either or questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Driving home for Christmas or last Christmas? Has to be driving home for Christmas. Presence in the morning or presence after lunch? I'm very impatient in the morning. <laughs> Quality street or celebrations? Quality street. Excellent choice, although other sweets are available, beloved viewer. Sprouts or peas? Sprouts, has to be. Sledding or ice skating? Sledding. Die hard or love actually? Die hard. Classic Christmas carols or modern Christmas songs? For a modern Christmas song, but it's not too modern. Keep it in the 80s. Keep it in I the reckon. 80s, yeah. absolutely. I, I think we're all agreed on that, aren't we, beloved viewers? Tree lights, white or colourful? White for me. Mulled wine or spiced apple? Definitely mulled wine. 
Home Alone or Elf? Home Alone. Christmas tree, real or fake? Real. Christmas pudding or mince pie? I'm afraid to say neither. 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 Goodness. If you've got any questions on that, beloved <laughs> viewer, then please put them in the Q&A. Board games or video games? For Christmas, board games. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic work there. Thank you very much. Um, you have passed the test that wasn't a test. And um, let me introduce you again to all of our viewers. So Emily Campbell Radcliffe is, uh, you have the most amazing CV, by the way, uh, uh, is currently the head of AI assurance for the Department for Science Innovation, but has also um, been the research assistant at Google DeepMind, a uh, member of OECD AI network of experts, the committee member for BSI, and a senior advisor for the Center of Data Ethics and Innovation. That is quite the, uh, quite the CV. How do you find time to fit all of this in? Uh, very little sleep, uh, <laughs> running around a lot, wearing a lot of trainers uh, to get yep. from place to place. But um, yeah, thank you. Uh, a lot of those are still simultaneous, so uh, trying to just make time where I can. Well, we are flattered that you have joined us uh, on your lunch hour for the show. Thank you very much for coming along. The Artificial Intelligence Management Essentials um, framework is uh, a brand new initiative from DSIT. And for those of you who aren't clear on what it is or haven't heard of it, we thought we'd put a few slides on the screen to talk you through the basics. So the consultation uh, has just gone live. And here's a quick recap of the things that the uh, AI Management Essentials, or AIM as we like to call it, are covering. Uh, it's a baseline of good practice for managing AI in your organization. So if you're thinking, uh, you know, we'd really like something from government that helps us understand the minimum things we should be doing, then uh, look no further than AIM. It consolidates key ideas and thinking from other AI management frameworks, such as the EUI Act, uh, the NIST and ISO protocols. It, uh, observance of AIM will increase general good compliance. So, um, think uh, about it as a little bit like a good shopping list. What is it not? Well, AIM is not mandatory and it's not law. It's also not a formal certification scheme. I think those things are really important to clarify. We've already seen a few questions on this previously. Um, following AIM isn't going to result in a certificate that says, congratulations, you're following AIM. It's more, well, as I said earlier, it's uh, more like a good shopping list of, of AI good governance. Uh, if you follow all of the things on this, then you'll end up with a really healthy compliance for AI. AIM has 10 sections, and we've summarized those on the screen for you. Uh, they are AI systems records, AI policy, fairness, impact assessments, risk assessments, data management, bias mitigation, data protection, issue reporting, and third-party comms. They are all 10 of the sections. Each section has a self-assessment question, and you get a rating for each section. AIM produces action points and recommendations for you, but what it won't do um, is, well, it, it will give you a score and it will give you suggestions, but um, it's not, not professional advice. Uh, and the consultation, I should say, focuses only on the AIM questions, but not on the logic or on the ratings. That feels like a good time to come back into the room and talk to uh, Emily all about it. So um, before we start, I'd be interested to hear a bit about your story. How did you get into the world you're in? How did you end up as the head of AI assurance at DSA? Um It's a very long and windy story, so I'll try and keep it short. Um, but I suppose kind of in most recent years, I started, I suppose, my kind of AI ethics, AI kind of and data journey when I worked for kind of an AI-led startup who were in the, the media monitoring space. Um, but whilst I was there, I headed up their strategic insights team, and so then started to have a kind of a more personal focus on exactly those topics. So AI ethics, data ethics, data protection, um, privacy laws, uh, AI use in the US, China, and other places. From there, I moved to DeepMind, which is where I worked between the ethics and society team and their public policy team. Mm -hmm. So started to get kind of both the research view of, of ethics and um, kind of good AI governance, but also the, the public policy side. Focus a lot on good global governance of AI, but also responsible research and, and norms around that and kind of responsible publication. Um, and then that felt like quite a natural move to then go into government and kind of complete my move all the way from industry into government and focus more on the policy side of things. Um, 
I initially was working more in the AI monitoring space because I had quite a general background. So I was looking at, at horizon scanning and, and new trends and potential, you know, future needs for regulation and, and other and other things. Worked on things like connected and autonomous, autonomous vehicles, um, and then I think I kind of somewhat. I suppose accidentally ended up in the air assurance space. I think my governance background, a job came up, um, and with my governance background and kind of private sector background, it felt like a, a really good fit. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been head of air assurance now for I think about two and a half years, um, and yeah, have been kind of growing the program and and trying to find new things that are, are useful for industry to to help them on their on their journeys. You're being very modest, I'm sure. Um, the let's let's start with the AI Management Essentials, which you co-authored with your team. Um, it's a very short document covering a lot of big topics. Is there a reason that it's so brief? Yeah, exactly. So AI Management Essentials is meant to be the basics. It's meant to be as accessible as possible, particularly for organizations who are very new to kind of internal AI governance. They're either new to deployment, new to development, um, haven't got those structures in place. And we wanted to make it as accessible as possible for organizations who are both time and resource poor to engage with with those types of practices. So we have tried to kind of amalgamate very long existing frameworks and pick out, kind of cherry pick the, the really key pieces of information that people need, the key practices that people should be engaging with, no matter what kind of regulatory jurisdiction they're operating in, mm -hmm. um, and helping them to understand, like you say, kind of what that good shopping list looks like for good AI governance. So we, obviously it's a fine line to walk between being comprehensive and being accessible. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping we've done, done quite a good job of it, um, but that's uh, exactly why it's, it's a relatively short document, because it's that, that first stepping stone for people before they hopefully actually then start to engage with more robust practices, mm -hmm. um, move on to those international standards. Um, but we know that at the moment that there's a big proliferation of frameworks, very complex standards that are expensive mm -hmm. and time intensive. So we wanted to give someone, some people something to, to engage with in the first instance. So that's kind of why we, we erred on the side of, of something a bit shorter. Okay, um, before we launch into a bit more on that, I should just say that we are live and the Q&A is open. So if you've got any questions for Emily, if you found yourself sitting there thinking, I've got a burning question on AIM and I'd love to know what the answer is, please do put it in the Q&A uh, and I'll put your question to Emily in a moment. Before we do that, um, the, the content itself, when you go through the 10 sections, uh, there are lots of binary yes-nos to some of the questions posed and um, I wonder why that is. I feel like some of the questions are quite easily yes-no. For example, do you have an AI policy? That's a yes-no. Do you have an AI um, risk record? Yes, no. But others are probably harder to answer because of um, their nature. So for example, do you apply fairness to your AI governance? I think for some organizations that will probably be a maybe or a not sure. So um, talk us through how you came to the uh, place where you have the binary answers to most of the questions. Yeah, so we, we did start actually not having a binary for most of the answers. We were. Um, despite being advised by our colleagues in cyber who had worked on cyber essentials who definitively said you should have a binary, it's easier. We thought, no, actually, we think some of these are too complex to answer with that, with that distinct binary. So we did start with multiple answers for each. Um, when we took it to user testing, we found that actually it, that made it a bit less accessible. So we used to have quite an even shorter document than we do now with kind of a broader range of potential answers. Um, and so now we've, we've kind of broken out those questions. So it's hopefully more questions to answer, but easier because it, there now is that binary. Mm -hmm. um, we also initially wanted to have kind of multiple choice for, for each question, but some of them necessi necessarily have to be a binary. So looking at kind of legal adherence, you know, that is that is a binary fundamentally. There's no kind of maybe we're complying with the law. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to stick with the binary, but then like you say, there are some, some cases where you just do have to have a middle ground. Yep. Um, also in other cases, the middle ground, so for example, on, on kind of, you know, fairness uh, with your AI policy, I think there might be a maybe, but that is probably near enough to a no if, yeah. it, if it's a maybe. So yes. we thought that actually the binary covers most things um, with the occasional need for, for a third way. I suppose the example being, um, you know, do you comply with data protection or maybe? Well, there is no maybe, it's not, it's not really how it works, is yeah. it? Um, uh, did you undertake user testing? in the build up to this, what kind of workshops and um, things like that did you do before publishing the consultation? 
Yeah, we did. So it was kind of obviously initially prepared via a lot of desk research um, and other engagement with stakeholders. And then once it had been built, we undertook quite significant user testing, both um, in kind of a, a, a broad range of areas, I suppose. So we worked with industry, both large industry and small industry, a number of roundtables to ensure that it was it was fit for purpose and it was accessible. Um, we had roundtables with the regulators, with civil society, with others, and we also tested with uh, the public sector as well. So. Um, particularly departments within the public sector who are quite advanced in their use of AI, we decided to test it, test it with them to kind of see, you know, how realistic is it that you can actually answer these questions when you're developing models, bringing models in, you know, what's the, is it, is it actually fit for purpose? So did relatively significant engagement through that, um, got loads of really great feedback and, and kind of have iterated since then. So even though we've, we've kind of published a draft, we have had, you know, I think this is kind of version 15 or something of the, of the actual aim that's yeah. gone, out, gone out to the public. Gosh. Um, thank you for all of the questions that are coming in. We will come to them very shortly. Are all the sections of AIM as important as others? Are they all, is there a hierarchy of some that are more important than others or, or actually um, are they all equally important when assessing good AI governance? Yeah, so I think with AIM, as we say, it's, it's this baseline, you know, in terms of what your good governance practices should look like internally. Mm -hmm. As it's a baseline, we would say everything is equal as important because they're all, they're all um, processes that you should be engaging with as an organization who is developing or deploying systems. But having said that, obviously, AI is very context dependent, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the risks of AI systems really depend kind of how you're deploying them in which sector and what kind of business. So obviously, there might be some sections that are more or less applicable depending on that. So if you are using recruitment tools or building recruitment tools um, or using automated decision making, then the bias and fairness questions are going to be you know, very important for you compared to maybe some of the other sections. But in general, we'd say all as important as each other. Um, but obviously, your context might, might mean that some potentially are, are more important to you. Um. Before we go to the Q&A, regarding the consultation itself, uh, it's been live for a month, I suppose, almost, just, under a, month, just yeah. under a month. What sort of feedback would you like from businesses, civil society, professionals, third parties? How can viewers and listeners of the AI and data show best respond to DC on this topic? Yeah, I think not to give ourselves uh, even more work than we're, than we're going to have. We kind of want all feedback, basically, editing anything is useful. Um, we have a survey, um, which also has some free text answers as well that you fill out. Um, it's all on gov.uk, very easy to find, just, just search for AI management essentials. Um, having said that, I think there are kind of three key areas that we're looking for feedback in. So potentially, uh, potentially, particularly usability uh, for industry, particularly those smaller organizations or larger organizations who don't have that kind of internal capacity to engage engage with AI governance if you are the person who's who's going to have to fill this out for your organization. Can you do it? Do you feel comfortable doing it? Is there anything that would be particularly difficult for you to do? Is there anything that you think just fundamentally isn't fit for purpose in there? So I think the usability for industry is really key for us. So that's one big area. Um, I think the second area is if we've missed anything major, like any red flags that you see reading this, particularly um, kind of on the, you know, we're not lawyers, on the legal side of things, is there anything that we've missed that would be, that should be in there? Are there any legal frameworks that we've forgotten about or kind of skated over? So I think that would be any kind of, yeah, any big red flags where it feels like we've really dropped the ball and something should definitely be in there that we'd also love to find out. Um, and then finally, we are, as we speak, writing the guidance alongside it. Um, anything that people feel would be particularly useful to signpost to or if you're reading this and you're imagining the kind of score that you get how can we help you improve that score what kind of information would you be looking for what kind of you know yeah guidance on the side would be most useful for you so i think those three key areas kind of the usability anything that we've really forgotten or dropped and then um any guidance that you think would be particularly useful Understood. Let's take your questions. Uh, thank you for those that have come flying in. If you've got questions now is the time, please put them in the Q&A, hit send, uh, and I will uh, put your questions to uh, Emily. Just reading through a few here. Um, the first one right off the bat is, I'm a DPO at my organization. Should I fill in the aim or should it be done by the InfoSec team? <laughs> Fantastic question, whoever that was. Uh, that is a, yeah, that is a great question. I think we hear a lot from industry. I think a lot of the time we assume that it will be 
DPOs who are kind of leading on these types of these types of frameworks. But mm -hmm. having said that, a lot of the questions you'll probably need f input from various teams. I would have thought, depending on your organisation. So it's probably more of a kind of a lead and then other teams, you know, like your infosec team feeding in. Um, so I think it depends on the setup in your organization, to be honest. I love that question, by the way. Whichever DPO that was, it was like, I have already got enough to do. <laughs> no more, please. <laughs> um, will the self-assessment eventually be available as an online tool rather than a paper-based questionnaire? That is the hope, yes. So at the moment we are designing up, so we're working on this and then a couple of other packages as well that we're, we're broadly calling AI governance essentials. So there'll be a few different tools and we're working at creating a kind of a separate hub that allows us to be interactive with them. So we're hoping, yes, it will be um, a kind of a separate site that you can engage with. And so once we've analyzed the consultation responses, we're hoping um, that the next version of AIM will be that interactive tool version. So yes, hopefully. A really interesting question on here about um, how would you convince more scientists, data scientists, to work in government policy roles? I might come back to that question. I let you think about that because that's obviously not about AIM, but it actually is a really interesting question. Thank you to whoever posted that in the feed. Um, someone here says, part nine talks about reporting, but I don't know who to report to. Is it the ICO or an internal process? So reporting as per AIM is is talking in terms of internal processes, so yeah. ensuring that you know who you're reporting to. So all organizations should have a reporting chain. They should understand who to be escalating to mm. all the way through, whether that's employees, whether that's the DPO. There should be kind of clear lines of accountability internally, and that's what that is referring to. Yeah, it's a really great question because there are definitely moments in time where the use of AI could result in, a, in an Article 33 GDPR data breach that actually is reportable, I suppose, the, the, the point the question asker might be getting at is, well, um, th this isn't telling me to do that. This is, this is telling all of the people in my organization to know that if something happens they think it's a data breach and, it's, and it involves AI, that this has to go through a particular process in a particular way and it doesn't just get lost or missed, I, su I suppose. That, yeah. That's the point you're making. I think also just to, I suppose just to add to that, a lot of the, you know, we're saying you should have a clear process for this, for AI, you probably already have it for other things like data protection breaches. Yeah. So, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, use the same reporting chains, use the same kind of um, chains of accountability. I think often with AI, there's this, feels this, people feel the need to start creating a whole new ream of um, kind of, yeah, Governance. reporting lines and governance but people already have risk management they already have data protection officers looking at this in terms of GDPR so I think reusing what you have as much as you possibly can um, would definitely be kind of encouraged yeah. um, oh this is a good one should we insist that third parties that we contract with comply with aim as part of our supplier due diligence so this is an organization saying um, before you can come before we'll buy services from you we want to know that you have completed AIM yourself and passed. What do you think of that? I, yes, yeah, so this is also actually something that we're thinking about in terms of, and before we published, we, we have been thinking about whether we want to do the same for government procurement, actually. We do think that it's a very good lever, and if you are procuring systems from third parties, knowing that they at least have the basic good governance i would say is a very good idea so i mean you know like i say this isn't law it's not mandatory but if that's a route that you would like to take it down mm -hmm. i think that you know can only be only be a good idea it's almost like ai cyber essentials in a exactly. way isn't it it's, it's yeah. a very similar kind of concept and um I, I could definitely see that taking off i could definitely see um a thing where actually you start to see in procurement questionnaires just another another bullet point added next to the annoying one that says do you comply with every part of the GDPR to which you think well I don't know any organization that complies with every part of the GDPR um, underneath that something that says have you completed an AIM test and, and how did you come out um, really interesting yeah I think also even with you know it could be that you've it's also about, I think, meaningful transparency from your suppliers. So it's not even about passing. It's just at least you as the organization procuring a system, you know where the flaws might be in the system. So it might not stop you doing that because maybe it's in an area where you kind of going back to your question about are, are some parts more important than others, maybe for your organization or for that system that you're procuring, actually 
the section where they perform badly isn't that important. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's fine. But I think it's about knowing what the limitations of the systems that you're procuring are. Mm -hmm. So it's also useful for that, for that kind of transparency from suppliers. You could also imagine there being um, a proliferation of additional questions from things like this. So if you're procuring a system where the AI risk uh, register is super important, you might say, do you have that? Can I see that? Can we look at that? Exactly. Like, there's yeah. a whole sort of subset of analysis there. Um, I, th I think it's really hard to uh, understate just how important the AI management essentials is. I've, I'm sure that right now knowing about it is sort of optional when you're in front of the pack and all that stuff. But 12 months from now, it will be fundamental to all of our work. And I imagine something that we'll all be looking at a great deal. Um, so once again, if you haven't looked at it, please, please do. Um, let's take one more question. Um, bias mitigation is hard because we are buying access from US tech corporates. How do I answer this question in AIM? It's a, a great question. I think in terms of, so also part of AIM at the moment is, I suppose, I mean, part of the consultation is us understanding if there are any questions that people can't answer. So if that is something you can't answer and the reason is because you're buying systems from, you know, the US or other organizations where you, you don't know about their bias mitigation processes or they don't have to tell you, um, then that's something that we'd like to hear in the, in the consultation response. But mm -hmm. yes, we as government also, we're thinking more broadly about bias mitigation and good bias audit. We know it's very difficult both from a model and data access point of view, but also from the point of view of kind of a lot of bias audit, for example, is very technical, but it's a socio-technical problem. So yeah. Yeah, we're aware that basically we're aware that that section is, is quite difficult to answer and we're trying to come up with other, I suppose, kind of policy interventions around that space because particularly for the model access side, it is very difficult for, for people buying from suppliers to ensure that. Um, but also, yeah, kind of feedback on the consultation and, and let us know that that's extremely difficult to answer and we need to do more in that space. Absolutely right. That's, um, I, you know, I think Emily hit the nail on the head. If, if you're in that position, then get onto the consultation. Let DC know. Uh, I want to come back to that last question again, uh, which just to reread from whoever the anonymous person was that put this in, I think it's a great question. How would you convince more scientists, data scientists, to work in government and policy roles? It's a great, it is a great question, and you gave me time to think about it, and I'm still not sure I have a very, <laughs> a very good answer. Um, I think one of the, I mean, one of the reasons why I came into government, I suppose, is that at the end of the day, when you're not in government, you're always shouting from the outside. No matter yes. who you work for, you can work for a deep mind at Google, but at the end of the day, you're always lobbying from the outside, and you can fundamentally make a real difference from the inside. You can have good ideas, you can see them through, and you can get them out into the into the real world. And I think not just data scientists, but I think for anyone, that's probably what I'd say to encourage them to work for government because. You know, the perks might be great elsewhere, but um, at the end of the day, being on the inside, I think, is, is kind of um, a, much, a much nicer situation to be in. So. Mm. It's a really great question, and uh, thank you for being brave enough to, to tackle it. Um, that is the end of our uh, fireside chat with Emily about all things... Um, to do with the AI management essentials. But before we wrap up, would you like to tell all of the AI and data geeks watching where they can find the consultation and what the deadlines are? Yep, it is on Government UK, it is live now. Uh, the consultation closes on the 31st of January. Um, so please get all your feedback in by then. We want to, as I said, we want to make sure this is robust and fit for purpose. So anything and everything, please do get in touch. And I, I believe the Crips team are going to put together a response as well. So if you're uh, really wanting to get involved but you're not quite sure what to do or you don't have the time to engage directly then uh, you can speak to us and perhaps throw some of your responses into our response and we'll one way or another we'll make sure it gets back to decent thank you very much emily for coming into the show thank you so much for having me it is the uh, we're, we're not too far from the end and we end every show in the same way uh, with our favorite feature which is the ai elves welcome back to the studio ai elves uh, you have come Christmas themed. Sorry, I almost, almost forgot. Um, because it's December, uh, we have compulsorily dressed our elves in Christmas attire, and you can tell they look really happy about it. Um, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Um, let's start with you, Amy. Uh, what have you seen AI doing in the last four weeks that really caught your eye? Uh, 
so I found out about an AI Jesus chatbot. <laughs> um, so worshippers in Switzerland can confess their sins to an AI version of Jesus. He can answer questions, he can provide advice, and he can even do this in more than 100 languages. Wow. Um, worshippers are told not to disclose any personal information, um, which maybe <laughs> suggests that empathy is something that AI can never replicate. Feels like a really obvious limitation as well. I think if you're going to AI confession with an AI Jesus and you can't talk about any of your personal information, it's going to be probably quite a limited experience. Um, maybe some GDPR compliance needed there. James, how about you? What have you seen AI doing in the last four weeks? So I've seen something slightly less festive, um, but the scientists at MIT have developed a tool that's known as the Earth Intelligence Engine, which helps to model which areas are likely to be affected, particularly by flooding, uh, following extreme weather events. Um, so to test the accuracy of it, they used some images that were produced by the model itself uh, against some uh, images of Houston in Texas following 2017 Storm Harvey, mm. and they found it to actually be pretty accurate. Um, so they're hoping that in the future it will increase readiness and help to encourage evacuations of local people. And is this being used by... MIT advising governments and things like that? Is that what they're doing with it? Uh, I haven't read anything about that, but I'm sure that, that will be the case, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I'm sure DEFRA would be very interested. It sounds like the kind of thing we need. Yeah. Um, Alice, welcome uh, back. Thank you. What have you seen AI doing in the last four weeks? Uh, so I've seen that O2 have recently unleashed Daisy, which is a sassy AI granny whose sole mission is to troll phone scammers. They're armed with a love for knitting and an endless supply of tales about her cat, Fluffy. Daisy keeps scammers uh, basically occupied in these absurd conversations, sometimes for as long as 40 minutes, <laughs> uh, until they give up with exasperation. So it's designed to sound like a sweet uh, but entirely clueless elderly lady. Uh, and the goal of Daisy isn't just to frustrate the scammers, but to keep them occupied as long as possible and unable to target real victims. What a fantastic use case. So um, uh, we have, uh, just to recap for you, we have um, the, G the Jesus chatbot. <laughs> Absolutely splendid. Uh, we need to check this out. I feel like I need to check this out after this. This sounds incredible. Uh, the Jesus chatbot, um, we have MIT and its flood mapping crisis environment um, stuff, which sounds really, really valuable. And then we have Daisy, who is absorbing the time of scammers by keeping them on the phone. Are they, so human scammers are talking to an AI chatbot yes. thinking that it's a human. Exactly, I love that. Right, in real time. That's amazing. Uh, it is tradition that we ask our um, learned guests to um, pick one of the three use cases as their favourite. Of the three that you've heard, which one piqued your interest? I think all brilliant. Um, obviously, disaster preparedness. I absolutely love the nerd in me. Loves all that, all of that kind of thing. But unfortunately, it has to be it has to be frustrating and trolling scammers uh, all day long. It has to be the number one for me. Frustrating the scammers wins. Congratulations. Uh, and I feel that's appropriate, Alice, because this is your last AI and data show. We are bidding farewell to you. Would you love to tell the beloved viewer what you're up to? Yes, bittersweet. Um, I'm off travelling, so. Uh, going around the world to Australia, New Zealand and Japan for the next four months. Well, we will miss you very much and we're all uh, really grateful for everything you've done and um, please make sure while you're out there will you do some AI and data research for us? Oh, absolutely. Feedback, yes. absolutely, yeah. <laughs> when you come back on then we'll, have, we'll do a whole show on <laughs> the things that you learned. Uh, that just leaves it to uh, me to wrap up the show and um, to thank you all for uh, watching. I'd like to thank uh, all of our guests over this season. We've had uh, John DeMang, Professor of AI at the Open University, who came on and explained to us all the amazing things that AI has been doing uh, and how it works, the functions of machine learning, uh, all of the clever, intelligent tech and mathematics that underpins um, AI. We had uh, Lewis Borg, who's Data Protection Officer for Unilever, explaining to us how uh, Unilever uh, the massive organization got itself ready for the EU AI Act and its own AI assurance process, the importance of transparency and, um, and AI audits uh, being a key takeaway there. We had Tim Pitt Payne KC, preeminent barrister at 11 KBW, unpacking all things international data transfers and the Uber fine. Uh, that was in last month's show. And of course, we had Emily Campbell Ratcliffe here 
talking about the importance of AI assurance and the brand new AIM framework and the consultation, which you should definitely be responding to. Um, that's not all we learned. We also learned that um, Lewis's life has been changed by New York bagels. If Tim Pitt Payne could go back to any period of time, it would be the Ice Age, that John DeMang wouldn't be seen dead wearing a tweed jacket and monocle, and that Emily loves Die Hard and hates mince pies. We uh, should also end by thanking, I want to end by thanking the AI elves past and present. Thank you to James, Megan, uh, Amy, and Alice for everything you've done, for all the hard work that goes into prepping these shows, for the research you've put in and more. Uh, extremely grateful and uh, at the risk of embarrassing them thank you to the production team to Charlotte Nicole Charlie Kirsty Paul uh, Rachel Chris and Josh you guys do an incredible job and we wouldn't be here without you so thank you very much finally thank you to you the beloved viewer for tuning in if you are around this Wednesday at five o'clock please come and join us for a Christmas tipple here at uh, Cathedrals and Cocktails in 80 Victoria Street otherwise We'll end slightly early and give you a few minutes of your day back. Thank you very much to all of you for tuning in to the AI and Data Show. Have an amazing Christmas. All the best. Goodbye. <laughs>